Hello and welcome to this video on pectin. This is the thing that makes jam gel, contributes to methanol in brewing and stabilizing agents in juice. As far as food chemicals go, pectin is relatively old. It has been used for a long time in a very crude form. It was extracted when using raw fruits to create preserves and other similar products. It wasn't until the mid 19th century that anyone isolated that has led to its use commercially and domestically. A fast-setting pectin is often used for preserves where you have whole fruit or parts of fruit included. Slow-setting pectin is used in other cases for situations where the fruit has been pureed or largely macerated into a consistent form. This often leads to a somewhat transparent product that's closer to a jelly Unlike most human cells, plant cells that we get pectin from do not have cholesterol and other lipids, at least not the same way living animals do. Instead, they use sugars. Pectin is one of these sugars. Broadly speaking, the cell wall uses pectin to create rigid and stabilized areas. Different kinds of pectins are used different ways. Some are more mobile than others. These include things like lactans. They help to restrict the movement of certain signals. There's also restrictions in enzymes and other molecules. The use of pectin also helps to keep the cell wall thick and keep it that way even under pressure. For example, when cellulose is lost. Largely, the pure and refined pectin covers a large group of polysaccharides, or long chains of sugars. This means that rather than being a single chemical, it is a group which we can describe in broader terms. This is important as not all plants have the same collection of pectins, and this is why if you are looking to try and make your own jam, you may not be able to make it effectively gel without the use of pectins that have been added on top of what the plant will make itself. Pectin acts as a kind of polymer, that is a long chain of molecules that can either be broken into smaller parts or rearranged to create a mesh-like structure. This is why pectin is so useful as a gelling agent. The ability to heat it up, somewhat separate it into smaller sections and have those reassemble and recombine around other material creates a gel-like product that has, for example, bits of fruit suspended in it. Pectin is made up of a varying unit or subunits within a long chain. One of the most common is galacturonic acid units. These are connected to each other using glycosidic bonds. Part of the galacturonic acid molecule is esterified using methyl esters. These contribute significantly to the structural element of pectin and help to make it the backbone of everything else that comes off as it branches out. This also contributes largely to that functional property of pectin in its ability to gel. Through modifying the esters that are found in these areas, you can either make it easier or harder to shift the electrostatic point of the pectin. This makes it more or less easy to then interact with other molecules. Along with your galacturonic acid, pectin contains other sugars that are largely neutral. These include things like D-galactose, rhamnose, arabinose, and xylose. Most of these are not very important. They largely contribute structure rather than function. The exception that we'll point out in particular is rhamnose. It is one of the major things that allow the pectin to have a kink in it. This then changes the direction and helps again to contribute significantly to that gelling and final more solid product. One of the reasons why pectin is used for jam making but not used as effectively as a substitute for gelatin used in things like jelly is that it doesn't work as well under all pH conditions. Notably, pectin is soluble in water, but not very soluble. 
In fact, it's largely unable to be mixed with most organic solvents. This is a bit of a problem. For example, if you were trying to add it to vinegar, ethanol, or similar, you would find that it doesn't dissolve very readily. And again, if you're trying to create some sort of jelly, that can be a problem. The easiest solution in many cases is to change the pH. And by doing this, you can significantly help with polymerization or the creation of those long chains, primarily using those methyl ester groups. pH is not the only way, but it's perhaps one of the easiest. The next is temperature. A temperature has a Goldilocks situation where too cold and it doesn't work, and too hot and it doesn't work. It needs to be in just the right range in the middle. Finally, there are ionic additions you can add. These are things like calcium. Calcium can either hinder or help under the right circumstances. Most of the time, it's arguable that it would hinder, as it does prevent the isoelectric point of pectin being shifted, as it gets in the way of the various changes that are needed. For many people, if you are either using well water, bore water, river water, or some sort of spring, you need to be aware of this, as it's likely to contain large amounts of minerals. And if there is minerals in your water, calcium is likely to be included in that. It will therefore get in the way of your pectin working very well. On top of the other issues, pectin itself, structurally, has a slight problem when it's trying to create bonds which are needed for gelling. It doesn't readily form hydrogen bonds between different chains, and this is only going to occur when there's something in there to cause ionization. For example, calcium. You can, as mentioned, change the pH and therefore shifting the isoelectric point, and compensate for this. That change in pH affects the ester parts of it that have been methylated. Generally speaking, you want to lower the pH, but not so low that it's going to prevent that from happening, and this can be quite difficult. One of the most common additions to make up for this difficulty is simply sugar. Things like sucrose or glucose will act as a very effective mediator between it and prevent things like water from getting in the way of these connections being formed. Once this happens and you get everything lined up properly, it's not going to go anywhere until you begin to cool down the pectin. Cooling down it allows for everything to form and release its energy into the environment. Doing this means that the possible ongoing interactions between different parts of pectin and different inclusions in your jam or jelly will no longer happen. There's no energy to allow for that reaction to occur. This has to occur somewhat slowly, as there's no way to re reduce the energy value completely very quickly. This is one reason why jam is often sealed in jars, and the loss of heat into the local environment is used as a way to seal those jars shut. When we're looking at pectin, one of the issues you're going to face, on top of everything else we've mentioned, is the bathtub type temperature where it's effective. Too cold, and you won't get your pectin to dissolve. At the other end is when it's too hot, and this is when boiling becomes a concern. Some people will, for example, boil jam, and in doing so, try to remove material that comes off in a scum-like appearance. This is obviously not ideal for flavour or texture. Removing it means you get better jam. The downside to this is that the pectin does not work as well. Your jam does thicken, and it does become somewhat syrupy, but the actual pectin itself does not work as well, and that's because of hydrolysis. That is, you begin to break up parts of the pectin into smaller sections, and rather than catching large amounts of your jam or jelly, you only get smaller parts. This is one reason why jam generally gets made at a lower temperature, and the temperature is not maintained for as long. It ensures the pectin is kept as intact as possible. 
Finally, as far as productivity goes, pectin is a concern when it comes to methyl alcohols, primarily because methylated alcohol or methanol is produced as a byproduct both when brewing with high pectin products, but also within the human body. Pectin itself can lead to an increase of methyl alcohol production in the colon. Admittedly, the amount you would have to consume is getting to ridiculous values, but if you're looking at this in terms of brewing, it may be possible that by adding various ingredients, you can significantly increase the amount of material that could give rise to methyl alcohols. This is one very strong reason to consider making sure that you get as little of apple peel in your cider as possible. Why it's not always a great idea to add whole berries to some sort of brewing project that you have going. These and other possibilities are considerations, but not necessarily something you can always avoid. Pectin is a product that is largely used for jams and jellies. These sorts of preserves are consumed globally on a relatively large scale. Despite this being its primary commercial use, it is relevant in other things. As we've mentioned, for example, when you're trying to make ethanol, but you get methanol when brewing. This is largely a problem of pectin being the cause. Of course there are other ways, but for the purposes of this video, consider removing pectin where possible. It's also a good example of being able to use pH to alter the final attributes of a food you're trying to make. If you want a jam, jelly or preserve that's a little more liquidy, but still able to be somewhat solid, you can alter the pH, or you can shift it the other way around and make it much more solid. You also need to consider that heating it up to a certain point will stop it from working. The chemistry of pectin means that there are certain things that are favourable and unfavourable. But the fact is, just about all plants have some kind of pectin in them, and if you are so inclined, you can extract it yourself and make your own. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.